Out of My Mind, Chapter 12. By the end of October, the inclusion program had been expanded. Marie and Jill had been added to art and gym classes, and Freddie and Willie go to science. Me, it's the first time I've ever gotten to change classes for different subjects in my life. Now when the bell rings, instead of wondering what's happening out there in the halls, I'm out there too. and It's awesome. I plow through the crowds in my electric chair like a power mower in thick grass. Sometimes kids wave and say, what's up? Every once in a while, someone will even walk with me to the next class. Cool. But inclusion doesn't mean I'm included in everything. I usually sit in the back of the room going crazy because I know answers to things and I can't tell anybody. What's the definition of the word dignity? One of my teachers asked a few days ago. Of course, I knew. So I I raised my hand, but the teacher didn't notice the small movement that I'm able to make. And even if she were to call me, what then? I can't very well yell out the answers. It's really frustrating. During parent conferences earlier this month, my parents came to meet Mrs. Shannon and the other teachers. Instead of leaving me on my own in the corner somewhere, Mrs. Shannon pulled me into the circle of teachers who were involved in the inclusion program. She's so great. She patted the arm of my chair and smiled. This child's got some serious smarts. She's going to be our star in this program. I did my usual screeching and kicking. I think I would have kissed her if I could, but that would have been pretty sloppy, I guess. Well, it's about time somebody recognizes what we've always known, my dad told Mrs. Shannon. We really appreciate the opportunity to let her show what she can do. Mom was especially pleased to find out I'd been assigned a mobility assistant, an aide of my own. Finally, Mom said, relief in her voice. We've been asking for this for years. Budget busting paperwork. A system that runs on grits instead of good sense. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Shannon replied, shaking her head. I'm trying to get all the students in H5 the services they need. But I smacked an aid for, Mel- smacked an aid for Melody way up to the top of my list, so we'll see how it goes. I'm expecting a wonderful school year. So cool, I tapped on my board. An aid? Wow. This person's job would be to take me to classes, sit with me, and help me participate. I wondered what she'd look like, or maybe I'd get a guy. Would he be young and cute, or old and grumpy? The very next day, my new aide was at school before I was, chatting with Mrs. Shannon in room H5, as we kids were wheeled in. She came right over to me and took my hand. Hi, Melody. I'm glad to meet you. My name's Catherine. I go to the university, and I'm going to be... Your deals and wheels every day. She talked to me like I was just like any other student, not a kid in a wheelchair. I tried not to kick, but it was hard to hold in my excitement. Cute t-shirt, she said, as she checked out Tweety Bird on the front of my new lavender top Mom had bought for me. I pointed to thanks on my board. What's your favorite color, she asked then. I pointed to purple, but then quickly slid my thumb over to green. I grinned at her. You're quick, Melody. I can see we both like weird colors. We're going to get along just fine. Catherine was dressed in purple tennis shoes, green tights, and a purple suede skirt. And the ugliest green sweater I've ever seen. I wanted to tease her about her outfit, but I didn't want her to think I was mean. After all, I'd just met her. I searched all over my board for a way to jokingly make fun of her clothes, but I couldn't think of a way to do it, so I gave up. It is so hard to say stuff. So now it's Catherine who helps me at lunch so I don't make a mess. It's Catherine who reads off the newspapers I point to on my board, off the answers I point to on my board. She's added some more words and phrases to it. She helped Mrs. Shannon order the books I need to read. She even makes sure the headphones don't fall off my ears. The regular fifth grade language arts teacher, Mrs. Gordon, is not too much older than Catherine. She almost explodes with energy and makes books seem like live action plays. She jumps up on the table. Sometimes she sings. She lets the class act out parts of stories. And sometimes she even burns book, turns books into games. Vocabulary bingo, Miss Gordon announced one morning. Donuts to the winning team. As they played, my classmates broke their necks to get the right definition, screamed out answers, and groaned when they messed up. In just half an hour, every student in the room knew all 20 vocabulary words. Mrs. Gordon gave donuts to the losing team, too, but... The winners got the ones with the chocolate sprinkles. I knew all of the definitions, but the other kids moved too fast for me. Chocolate would have made a mess on my clothes anyway. One unusually warm day this week, Mrs. Gordon brought in fans and spray bottles of water 
and let us eat popsicles in class. Orange ones, of course, in honor of Halloween. While she read poems about pumpkins and ghosts, Catherine held my popsicle for me and a paper towel under my chin. We didn't spill one drop. Mrs. Gordon does other cool things too, like when she decided the class would read the story of Anne Frank, she had kids turn take turns squeezing into small space she had built under a table so they could understand how Anne might have felt. I couldn't do that, but I got the idea. And she's assigned other books too this semester. I'm reading, well, listening to Shiloh by Phyllis Reynolds, Naylor, and The Giver by Lois Lowry. And there's one called Tuck Everlasting. The kid never gets to grow up. Staying a child forever is not as cool as folks may think. Because of Mrs. V, I could actually read the books, but the print is usually very small and it's hard for my eyes to stay on the right line. And nobody has figured out the best way for me to hold on to a book without it falling on the floor a million times. So I usually choose the audiobook instead of the written version. I even take tests now. Catherine reads me the questions and I point to the answers on the sheets she places on my tray. I pass every single test. and She doesn't help me one single bit. I would probably get 100% on each one, but some of the questions require long answers. I just can't explain with the words on my board. One time in spelling, Mrs. Gordon read the word alou- words aloud and I pointed to the letters on my board. Catherine wrote down what I pointed to so I could follow along with the test. Claire and Molly, who were always watching me, it feels like, began to complain. It's not fair, Claire cried, waving her hand to get Mrs. Gordon's attention. Catherine cheats for her, Molly added. What is it with those two? It's like they're jealous of me or something. And that's just plain crazy. At the same time, I realized that they actually thought I had it easier. (laughs) That sure was a first. Last Monday morning, Mrs. Gordon told the class, as some of you may know, because I do this every year, our long-range fifth grade project this year is our biography unit. We will read the biographies of famous people, do a report on a famous person of your choosing, and each of you will also write your own autobiography. Well, it's got to be short. But what can you do in 11 years, Connor? The big kid shouted. Even everybody laughed. In your case, Connor, Mrs. Gordon replied, I'm sure you'll think of a way of way too much. Can I do my report on the guy who invented hamburgers? Connor asked. To more laughter. I doubt if we know who made the first hamburger, but you can do your report on the person who founded McDonald's. He got rich off hamburgers and fries. Awesome, my kind of dude, Connor said. Rose raised her hand. I love the fact that she's in all my inclusion classes. Mrs. Gordon, when is all this due? Rose is the type of student who takes all kinds of notes in a bright red spiral planner and never misses a homework assignment. Relax, Rose. We've got until the end of May, and I'll walk you through each segment one step at a time. Tomorrow, we'll talk about how to write your memories. Rose seems satisfied, but I noticed she scribbled almost a whole page in her notebook. I'd give anything to do that. But working on stuff that teachers in regular classes assign is just plain awesome. History class is even better than language arts class. Even though the teacher, a man named Miss, Mr. Deming, has none of Mrs. Gordon's spark. Balding and pudgy, he's been teaching at the school for over 20 years, and his kids say he's never been absent. Not even once. Clearly, he loves what he does. His car is always in the parking lot when our buses roll in, and always there when we leave for the, for the day. He dresses like a TV preacher in a three-piece suit with vests most days. I've never seen him without a crisp white shirt and a colorful tie. I wonder if his wife picks them out. Some of them are really sharp. Mr. D loves history. He can quote facts and dates and wars and generals like somebody on a game show. I bet he could win Jeopardy. The other students don't seem to like Mr. Deming much. They call him Dimwit. Deming. Behind his back. I think that's sort of mean because Mr. D is really smart. Smart enough to run the quiz team. When Mr. Deming got to American presidents in class, I rocked. He gave, me the, he gave the students a list of presidents and all their vice presidents and told us there would be a test in a week. Catherine read the names to me several times. I've never even heard of some of these men, she admitted to me as we went over the list the first time. Hannibal Hamlin was Abraham Lincoln's first vice president. Who knew? I memorized them all. But when Mr. Deming gave the test, All I had to do was point to the right answers. 
He checked to make sure that Catherine wasn't helping me. I even finished before some of the others. While Mr. D was returning the test papers, he gave the class a few minutes of free time to sharpen pencils or stretch and talk. I was surprised to see Rose walking toward my desk. How did you do the test, Melody? She asked. I only got 75, she looked disappointed. I'd gotten an 85, but I was so excited that she'd come over to me that I got all mixed up, so I pointed to 58 on my board. She touched my arm, her eyes full of sympathy. Don't worry, she said. You'll do better next time. And she did this right in front of Mel and Molly and Claire and the rest of the class. There was no way I was going to tell her what I really got on the test. I tried to think of something to say so she'd stay longer. Pretty and shirt was all I could come up with using my lame board. I'm sure I could use word choice that said cool outfit, but somehow Mrs. B had overlooked that one too. But Rose beamed. You look nice today. I really didn't. I had on a faded blue sweatshirt and matching sweatpants. Mom hardly got me anything else these days, but I hate sweatsuits. If I could choose, I'd wear blue jeans with sparkly decals, a blouse with decorated buttons and a vest. But I had no way to tell Rose, so I just pointed to thank you. And Incredibly, she touched my arm one more time. Then she went back into her seat and her friends. Then the bell rang. Class was over, and I had to go back to H5. No more inclusion. No more Rose. And four more hours of school left. Even Catherine left. She had an afternoon class at the university and hurried to get there on time. Mrs. Shannon was out sick that day, so I sat quietly with Ashley, Maria, and Carl and Willie while we watched The Lion King again. I've seen it a million times. I can quote it. Then the substitute teacher gave us a math lesson. Addition again. When am I ever going to get to long division? I wonder what Rose was doing. It was a very long afternoon.